All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, Mark chapter 3. Uh, we're in a series that is going through the book of Mark, and uh, right now we are landing in Mark chapter 3. And uh, it's another, uh, another scene that Jesus has found himself in, uh, another scene when he's confronting this dysfunctional system, this religious system that uh, categorizes people as, as, you know, good people, bad people, uh, people that deserve to be blessed, and, and all the other people that uh, are on the outside looking in. Kind of the, all the things that we hate about religion, Jesus is confronting right here. And uh, we see this story in Mark chapter 3. Uh, it says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue, or it's just a, a Jewish church, the temple, and there was a man with a shriveled or withered hand. And some of them, uh, the other people, the other parishioners, the other church goers, the other temple goers, uh, they were all in there and they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him very closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everybody. And Jesus uh, asked them, uh, everybody in the synagogue out loud made an announcement, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. And then Jesus looked around with anger, angry Jesus. We don't read a lot about angry Jesus, do we? We like, like, like our, our Jesus with like, a, you know, a nice white sheep on his back, just like walking on the water with just this peaceful look. And Jesus never got angry, right? No, that's not true. Angry Jesus we see here. Uh, manic Jesus right here. And, and so uh, he, he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored. Uh, the message I want to preach is called... Stretch out. Stretch out. Lord, I pray that you will help me deliver this message in a way that could touch our hearts, Lord God, wherever we are at in life. However old we are, no matter what we're dealing with, Lord God, there is something in our life that has shriveled, that has withered, Lord God, that you want to restore. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stretch out. Uh, stretching is so important. During the day, I don't know if you realize that, but you actually get shorter. During the day, you actually, you actually shrink. Uh, all of us, we, we shrink between uh, a half and three quarters of an inch during the day. And, and it is so vital uh, every morning when you wake up, before you go to bed, to do what? Stretch is so important because if you don't, you're going to end up shriveling up and, and uh, ending up being like, a, like an old raisin one day because you didn't, was that offensive? Stretch. You, you got you to gotta stretch. And Jesus always wants us to be able to, to stretch. And Jesus is looking at a church that hasn't gotten this concept, a, a church that has been shriveled, a church that has shriveled hearts. And there was this man that had a, 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 a withered right hand, a shriveled right hand is what uh, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 6, verse 6. And this man wasn't even supposed to be in church. I don't know if you knew this, like we talked about the leper last week. The leper had to stay how many feet away from everybody? Six feet away from everybody. Can you believe that? That was in the Bible. And, and so uh, the leper wasn't allowed in church. And now uh, they were, had all these rules back then of, of who could come into church. And uh, a guy with a shriveled hand was actually one of the ones that wasn't allowed in church. It, it says, listen, it's Leviticus chapter 21. Uh, people kind of regulations that they had. Uh, it said, no man is allowed to come into the temple uh, who had a defect could come near. No blind man or lame, disfigured, or deformed person. No man with a crippled foot or hand. There it is. Or who is hunchback or dwarf or has an eye defect or has a festering or running sores or damaged testicles. I'm not making that up. <laughs> That's in your Bible. You say the Bible is boring. No, you're boring. The Bible is crazy. So I <laughs> wonder how they figured out who to let in church. We'll leave that. You know, anyways. Uh, no descendant of Aaron the priest who has any defect could come near the presence of the offering to the Lord. And so this man wasn't allowed to be in synagogue, but for his 
benefit, he was able to hide his defect because you got two hands. He had one that was shriveled and withered, but he had one that was, was a good hand that he could reach out and, and he would be able to kind of hide his flaw, hide his, his brokenness. And, and then Jesus is so good at calling us out. Jesus is so good at seeing beyond what we present to everybody else. He sees the deepest parts of our life, the parts that we don't want anybody to see. And he looks at this man who shouldn't even be there, who snuck in, who's hiding his weakness. And he says, hey, you, stand up. Imagine if we did that today. And everything that you're hiding, you don't want anybody to know, what you did last summer, and everything in between, and, and all of a sudden you get called out on it. I think that would be a fun exercise. Don't think we'd have many people in church on a Sunday, though, if we did that. You know what I mean, Melissa? I, I mean, people wouldn't want to be a part of that because it, it's exposing. It's like, I don't know if you've ever been somewhere that you know you weren't supposed to be, and then somebody calls you out on it. You get that feeling in your stuff. Like, you ever go to a, I don't know if you're allowed to do this anymore. I remember, you know, w when we were young, we would, we would go uh, to a Mets game, and we'd be able to go to, the, like, the, the season ticket holders that wouldn't show up, and you'd go and sit in their seats. And you were so excited, you were closer than you should be, you were kind of doing something wrong, but like, you know, what was I really, because they're not here, who am I really hurting, right? Uh, and so you, you sneak to the front row, and then all of a sudden, you hear the ushers say, hey, you blondie, on the third base dugout, you, stand up, and, and then you get, it's uncomfortable, you get, you get exposed, and so this guy, he, he got exposed because he was in a place that he wasn't supposed to be, but what is so amazing is that Jesus doesn't expose you to embarrass you. He exposes you so that you could present your weakness in order for his grace to be able to heal it and restore it because this is the thing that many of us struggle with. We think that our weaknesses and our flaws are the things that could separate us from God. This was what people were dealing with back then. They couldn't be in the presence presence of God because they were afraid that if they were exposed, that it would somehow create a barrier between them and God. But I love the way Paul puts it. This guy in the Bible, his name was Paul. This is what he says about what can separate us from the presence of God. This is the new covenant. This is the good stuff. Are you ready? I, I, I didn't think that that was very good, Philip. I, I, are you ready? I mean, this is what Paul says. What shall separate us from the love of Christ, almost like a challenge. What can separate you from the love of God? And then he starts listing stuff, so trouble or hardship or persecution, what people are saying about you or famine, what, you, what you're lacking, what you don't have. You think that can separate you from God's will or nakedness, being exposed or danger or sword. And then he steps it up a notch. This is what he says. He says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, things we can't see, neither the present things that you're struggling with today or the future stuff that you are worried about that might happen later on. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, which means whatever your situation is this morning, because there are a lot of different ones here this morning, some of them big, some of them secret, some of them it's being exposed right now, but it doesn't matter what your situation is, your struggle is, it cannot separate you from the love of God. Grace covers every weakness, every fall, everything that is shriveled. It's covered by the grace of God, and Jesus was around people that didn't understand this, and Jesus was frustrated. He says, a man with a shriveled hand. The man wasn't identified by his weakness, but his weakness was just part of who he was. And so Jesus comes to do two things. These are the two things I want to talk about for the rest of our time, the few minutes we have left. Two things that Jesus wants to confront, the two things that Jesus wants to heal in this situation. And the first one uh, is, is not necessarily what you think. The first one is the hearts of everybody that is in the synagogue that day. Because the man's shriveled hand was just an outward representation of the hearts of everybody sitting in the synagogue that day. And Jesus was angry. Jesus was frustrated that this is what his church had become, a church that was more concerned about who they were letting in rather than the conditions that people had in order for God to be able to heal them and meet them where they are. Jesus wants to get to the root of your problem. See, a lot of you, you have so many different problems every week. 
And all you're doing, you're exhausted because you're just running around fixing problems all the time. But you never deal with the root that is causing all of the problems that you're facing. Jesus wants to get to the root. Like one of the problems in our household, our son, he's, he's going to be two April 10th. Oh my gosh, Dewey's going to be two April 10th. I'm so excited. We're, we're actually going to be right after Easter Sunday. Uh, we're, we're literally, we have a plane at 3.30 at a Newark airport. We're flying down to Florida. We're going to take him to Star Wars land. I can't wait because we got to take him on a plane before he turns two because when you're two, you got to put the two-year-old in a mask. And I don't think Dewey can handle wearing a mask on a plane. And if you don't wear a mask on a plane, they throw you out of that sucker. You know, kind of like church back in the day. You know? And so, so Easter Sunday ser- sermon is going to be real short. I got to catch a plane. But, uh, <laughs> So, what was that? The Dewey. So, so Dewey, uh, he, he's, D- Dewey's like, like a walking disaster where everywhere he goes, like Diamond literally, she felt really guilty after she said this. She goes, she goes when I look at Dewey, I think of that First Peter chapter 5 scripture, like, like a roaring lion seeking what he may devour. Like that's like Dewey like seeks around the house like looking for things to spill, looking for things to break, looking for remote controls to throw, looking for drinks to spill. Like that's what he does. And so all day long, we are cleaning up messes because every cup that is left out, Every cup that is on the edge of the counter, on the edge of the bar, on the edge of the windowsill, on the edge of the bedside, it it gets thrown to the ground. And we're literally cleaning up messes, and we're exhausted. I should say my wife, she does more of it. She's exhausted. And and this 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 is a picture of us. We're exhausted all the time cleaning up messes, whether that you created them or somebody else, and you're frustrated at the people, you're frustrated at the water spilling, but this is the thing. What's the root? You got to get to the root. The, the problem is we're leaving water out, drinks out, that are easily spilled. See, if you get to the root, then all of a sudden your problems will start to dissipate a little bit. And, and see, your, your problem isn't the addiction. Your, your, your problem isn't just the, the anger. Your problem isn't the self-destructive behavior. The problem isn't the depression. But there is a root inside of you that Jesus wants to be able to touch and heal. Because if he could get to the root, then the behavior will follow. The Bible says that, that you need to guard your heart because out of your heart flows all the issues of life. So if God can heal your heart, if God can bring security and approval to your heart, then everything else around you will begin to change and line up. So Jesus wants to get to the root. And so that's what he's doing in this passage. And the first root he wants to get to uh, is something we all struggle with. He wants to, he wants to heal their pessimism. Did you see that one scripture? Mark chapter 3, verse, verse 2, it says, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Looking for a reason. This is like a universal principle. It doesn't even matter if you're a Christian. You have to believe this. Here it is. You ready? You always find what you're looking for. It's just, it's just a law. If you, if you are looking for a reason to be offended, you will find a reason to be offended. If you are looking to be bitter, you will find a reason to be bitter. Uh, you know, you, you come into a church like this, uh, and, and you're looking for something not to like, you will find something not to like, because you will always find what you're looking for. And, and, and that is why so many of us, we live every single day with this mentality, this pessimistic mentality. Uh, you know, like, like nobody likes me. Nobody ever appreciates me. Uh, you know, nobody ever calls me back. And, and then we are shocked when we fulfill our own prophecy. Because you are always going to find what you're looking for. And some of you, all, all you're doing is looking to collect evidence to confirm a conclusion that you have already came up with. And so often, this is how we live our life. So many people, your situation is always going to reflect your psychology. 
If you think you're bad at something, you're going to be bad at that thing. If you think nobody likes you, if you think, you know, people are always talking about you behind your back, people are always criticizing you, your insecurities are always going to be confirmed by how you perceive what other people are doing to you or saying about you because you have already came to a decision that nobody likes me, that my past is the reason why uh, I'm always going to be behind uh, because I just have this pessimist life mentality that I live with. What's the first thing a doctor always says to you, Teresa, when you go to the doctor and you're not feeling well? Stick out your tongue. Because he can always tell by looking at your tongue how your behavior and how you're going to be feeling. Because whatever you confess, whatever you're looking for, will always happen. This is what the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And now these people had an opportunity to witness a miracle, but they'd rather be looking for something in Jesus to expose. They were, here, here's a, a buzzword, they were prejudice. Preju prejudice is different than being racist, okay? Because prejudice is basically, the answer is in the word, prejudge. They prejudged Jesus. They didn't even give him a chance because they already came up with the conclusion before they ever experienced what Jesus came to do. Because this is the thing. This is why we're, we're prejudiced. This is why we, we are pessimists. is because we have already came to a conclusion in our minds. We've already decided in our minds. And now we're just looking for evidence to confirm what we already are believing. I remember uh, uh, it was when this whole pandemic first started. Um, there was, uh, there was somebody that pulled into my driveway. And uh, it was like, kind of like, like, a, like a hoopty car. And, and I was like, oh, like, like what's going on? Uh, you know, who is this person? It's dark out. And, and, and I, I started to panic. I was like literally about to call the police. Like, what is going on? Person gets out of their car. And, and, and I'm like freaking out. I'm like, Diamond, what is going on? She's like, oh, that guy's delivering our groceries. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Like, well, anyone ever, I mean, like, like, it's weird. Like, now, you know, I'm like, oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> you know, he's, he's delivering what I wanted, but because it didn't come the way I expected, I wanted to send it away and, and because I was prejudiced. See, a lot of times God wants to give you wisdom that you've been praying for, but because it doesn't come the way you expected it, you push it to the side. But God will always use the, the, the people that you never expected it to come from, the ones that you maybe had written off, the ones that you have prejudged as, as, as not up to your level, whatever, um, psychologically or intellectually. And, and many times those are the people that God will use to deliver the message that you have been praying for. But if you do not get out of the judge's seat, and begin to receive what God wants to give you through the most unusual people, then you'll always be stuck with a judgmental spirit battling your entire life. But Jesus wants you to stretch your hearts. He wants to stretch your grace and your compassion to be able to receive a word from anybody, the least likely of people. It could come from your mother-in-law. It could come from somebody that you have written off years ago, and then all of a sudden, God will give a word for you through that person. What are we celebrating today? Palm? Who's got them palms? Couple people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I got, hold on one second. I snagged like, like half the palms. And, and so, so uh, we're talking about being prejudiced, right? So Jesus comes on Palm Sunday, what we're celebrating now. And, and they started waving their palms. Everybody waved their palms, throw them up in the air like you just don't care. Throw them up in the air like you just, all right. They're, they're waving their palms, and they're saying this. this is, they say this, Yashana. Yashana. You didn't know you were going to learn Greek this morning. And, and so they're, they're, they're yelling Yashana, which means victory now. And then you know what they, they, they did a week later? Kill them now. Kill them. Why? Because victory didn't come the way they expected it to come. 
Because you have had your mind made up of how God's going to do it for you, how God's going to heal you, how God's going to bring you out of depression, how God is going to bring forth maybe, maybe that, that man or that woman that you have been waiting for. A certain, you've had your mind made up. This is how it's going to come. And now God is bringing it in a direction you never saw coming. And because you don't open up your eyes and stretch out your hearts, you're going to miss what you've been praying for because God wants to break your prejudice. He wants to break the pessimistic heart that you have, and he did it for this man. Look for it. Stretch your hearts. What if you woke up every morning like this? Rather than saying, everybody's out to get me, God is for me. God, then you are going to look for evidence to confirm the conclusion that you have already made. I wake up every morning and, and, and say, uh, um, th this is what, what one scripture said. Uh, it says that all things work together for my good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What if you woke up every morning like that, and even when hardship comes, even when trouble comes, if you have already made up your mind that somehow, some way, it's going to work out for my good and my glory, then I'm able to get through hardships and trouble and struggles and disappointments because I have already made up my mind that it's going to work out for me. I feel like I'm preaching a lot better than you are responding this morning, but maybe that, that's just, maybe that's just me. Make up your mind how you want to live, and God's going to bring it to you. This is, this is what Jesus did. He was angry, and he said to, to everybody, Jesus stood up and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up in front of everybody. And, and then he, he said, what is more lawful, to heal on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill, and they remain silent. The Sabbath have gotten so crazy with what you could do on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day of rest. Okay, I got to just teach this to you real quick. The day of rest. You had to work six days, but then the Sabbath you had to rest, right? And they had all these rules about things that you could or you couldn't do on the Sabbath. And you, you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. This was one of their rules. Uh, you know, another one, you could take 1,999 steps on the Sabbath. But if you took 2,000 steps, it was considered work. So if you had your iPhone and you took 1,999 steps that day and you were still 100 feet from your front door, you were sleeping in your lawn. Like, that's how ridiculous they had gotten with the letter of the law. Uh, you, this is what you, you could. You could help and, and heal somebody who had like a fatal wound, a gunshot wound. Uh, and you, you could help that person, but if they just fell off a roof and broke both their legs and they would be able to survive until the next day, then he had to suffer for the day. You couldn't help that. That, that was how legalistic they were. This is how, you know, shriveled their hearts were. And now you had a guy with, with a, a deformed, shriveled hand who he was going to live to the next day. Jesus sees him. He could have said to Peter, Peter, tell him I'll meet him outside and I'll, I'll heal his hand tomorrow. Just let him know that. But Jesus wanted to demonstrate that this is a new covenant, this is a new way, this is a new Savior that has grace above the law. And, and, and even though other people might not understand it, my grace will cover it. And he says to that man, stretch out your hand. How many hands do you have? How many? You got two. This dude had one good hand, one bad hand, and he had an option. Which hand are you going to stretch out? Because we're really good, aren't we, Melissa? I don't know why, you're just like right there, Melissa. You know, we're really good at, you're like my new Joe Responti. You're, we're really good <laughs> at stretching out our good hand, showing our, our Sunday hand, you know, our, how you doing? Oh, praise the Lord. You know, all the time, right? Like we're so good at just like, you know, I'm doing great. Everything's great, showing our good side. But, but, but he, he didn't want to heal, and he didn't want to see his good side. He said, I want to see your brokenness. I want to see the part of you that isn't working. I want to see that area in your life that is shriveled and withered away and you don't think it's ever going to function the way it was supposed to because you've done so much damage to it, whether you or somebody else, and you don't want anyone to see it. You want to hide it. You, you don't ever want to expose it, and you want to live the rest of your life hiding your brokenness, hiding your pain. And he says, stretch out your hand, and I love it. This guy was on it. He stretches out what? 
his shriveled hand. So now I want to talk about, as we finish here, can you give me six and a half more minutes? Seven. I like seven. I'm going to do seven. He says, I, I want you to stretch out your, your hand. He wanted to stretch their hearts. Now he wants to stretch this guy's hand. And, 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 and Jesus came to restore this man's weakness. See, God's will and God's word will always stretch you. This man didn't want to stretch. He wanted to play it close. He held it close. And see, God's word will always stretch you beyond what you think you could do in your own ability. See, this is a principle of the kingdom of God, it is that God wants to stretch you. God wants to stretch your reach. God wants to stretch your influence. God wants to stretch your abilities. God wants to stretch your dreams. God wants to stretch the, the limitations that you have put on your life, saying that you could go this far and no further. He says, stretch out and stretching hurts. Does anyone ever, I, I, should, I should have somebody come up here and do the sit and reach and you let me know. Remember that? Remember that like sixth grade sit and reach and they like measure, you know, how far you can, <laughs> you, I don't think, do they do that anymore? I'm like exposing my age right now. They actually did that. I remember the sit and reach. It hurt. Stretching hurt. You wake up in the morning and you try and bend down, touch, it hurts because that's what happens when something has been at rest for so long, something has been dormant so long. That's why for some people to be able to say I'm sorry to somebody actually is painful. It hurts because you have not said I'm sorry for so long. And when you allow something to be at rest for so long, the first time you do it hurts. The first time you're in church and, and, and they, they, they say, you know, uh, I want you to pray. It's weird. It's It hurts. It's hard because you've never done it before. When you raise your hands, or it's, it's hard because you've never done it before. Stretching hurts. And this man has an arm that is withered. Withered arm. I, I, I researched what these withered arms in biblical times, what they were like. Chelsea, this is crazy. You're a physician's assistant. Right? This is what they said. A, a withered hand had no muscle, had no tendons, and the bone was like, like deformed. Like this guy physically couldn't stretch. Physically. He didn't have the anatomy. He didn't have the muscles. He didn't have the ability to stretch, to reach out his arm. And so Jesus was telling him to do something he couldn't do on his own. And that's always what faith is. See, faith is not just hearing a word. Faith is not just uh, 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 reading a scripture. Faith is action. And he is asking this man to do something that he has never done before. And I'm telling you that that is where God will always lead you. He will always lead you somewhere that you have never been before. Maybe you're the first person in your family to ever have a successful marriage. That is what God is calling you to do. Maybe you're the first person in your family to ever graduate from college. God is always going to stretch your limitations. Maybe you're the first person in your family to ever own a home. Maybe you're the first person to ever be able to, to live uh, physically fit in your life uh, because everybody else in your family has gone in a different direction. Maybe you're the first person to ever be able to, to have a family and be a father that's actually there for your kids because your father was never there for your kids. And, and God is saying, I want to stretch what you think that you could do on your own. And, and this is what, this is what I, I can't really wrap my arms around because I always thought that this was Jesus touching the man and Jesus grabbing his arm and then it it was healed, but that's not what happened. What happened was he, he almost, his faith in God's word produced his own miracle. Because Jesus never touched him, he just gave him a word. Do this. And when he did what he didn't think he could do, all of a sudden he was able to have what he never thought he could have. And let me just say this to you. When was his he hand restored? If you put, it, put, put the scripture up there. Was it restored when, when Jesus gave the word? Stretch out your hand? No, 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 no. It was when he acted on the word that God had given him. I dare you 
to try and do what God is asking you to do that you don't think that you could do within your, I, I dare you to leave your past behind you. I dare you to begin to step out even though it's not in your personality to, to, to maybe get up on a stage and share your testimony or put yourself out there. You're so introverted. I dare you to be bold for Jesus. I dare you to step out into the abyss, the unknown, uh, something that no one in your family has ever done before and step out and give faith a chance to operate in your life. Be vulnerable, be exposed, and I'm telling Telling you the fruit of doing that is going to not just save you, but it is going to open up the eyes of the people all around you, the people in your family that never thought that you could do it, never thought that you would ever amount to anything. All of a sudden, your faith in God's grace and his word is going to open up the eyes to everybody around you to say, look what the Lord has done. If he could do it for homeboy, homegirl over there, then he could do it for me too. You're going to inspire those people around you, but it's not going to come through you just just. Keeping it close to the vest. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not exposing anything. But it's when you stretch out. Stretch out your hearts. Stretch out your compassion. It's amazing what stretching can do. Close with this story. It's about my girl Lily. So my girl Lily, I love her so much. And so she goes to me in the car the other day. Uh, she's really upset. She, she goes to me. She says, Daddy, I, one thing I really don't like about school right now. I said, what's that, honey? She says, Daddy, I, you, you can't be generous anymore. I said, what do you mean, Lily? What do you mean? And she goes, well, the other day, one, one, of, my, one of my friends in school was having a bad day. And Lily, she's, she gets ornery. Don't, like, don't get me wrong. She's... She's got, she's got her shriveled hand parts too. You know, she could be a little crazy, but she has such a heart of compassion. When she sees someone hurting, like it's just in her to wanna, wanna hug them, to wanna help them whenever she can. She's like, I, I was so upset because my friend, she, she left her, uh, it was like her folder that had her glue stick and her pen and her pencil. She left it home. And, and she's like, I had an extra pen and an extra, I had an extra glue stick and I wanted to share with her, but we're not allowed to share in school. She's like, and I was so upset because, like, I, I knew I could help her, but I couldn't help her because we're not allowed to, right? And I, I'm like, almost like crying, like, oh, my God, that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard in my life. It gets worse. <laughs> and then she, she goes to me, she goes, but, Daddy, you want to know what, what I did? I'm like, what, what did you do? What did you do, Lily? She's like, she's like, when we were on the playground, she's like, I, she's like, I ran up to her. I gave her the biggest hug I've ever given her before. <laughs> and, but this is the best part. This is what, this is what she said. This, she goes, and Daddy, <laughs> she never saw it coming. <laughs> and I said, yes. That's where I'm going to land this sermon. That when you stretch out your faith, your generosity, beyond what you're able to do, you're never going to see the blessing coming that God's going to give you. I never saw it coming through that person. I never can't saw it coming through that from that direction. I never thought coming to church was going to actually set my spirit free and heal my bro. I never expected that this church service is actually going to minister to me and speak to my situation and my heart. But you're never going to see it coming. God has a way of delivering what you need in the most unlikely ways. If he did it for this man with a shriveled hand, he'll do it for you today. Amen. If you're able to just... Just stand to your feet right now. We're going we're gonna to close this service out. Amen. Some of you standing up, you're just like, stretch out. Uh, stretch out. Yes. Let's just bow our heads right now. Thank you, Jesus. What is that area in your life that's, that's shriveled a little bit, that's withered? It's not where it should be. It might be your attitude. It might be your heart. It might be something that you have kept so close to your vest you don't want to ever expose, but God's saying it's the broken places in your life I want to heal, I want to touch, I want to restore. Release it to me now. Father, I pray right now for every, everyone in here, all those hidden areas in our life this morning. We walked in here with them. 
praying that nobody would see, that, that no one will know what I'm really dealing with because it's, it's just too painful to talk about. But God, you're calling us out this morning. You on the third row, you in the back. I see you. I know what you've been through. I know where you're hurting. Will you stretch it out to me this morning? Will you stretch out that area in your life that is, is, is so broken right now? And, and on my word, will you give it to me? This is what Jesus said. He said, come all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. How is he able to give me rest? See, Jesus worked so that we could have rest. The work that he did on the cross is able to give us rest, where we could unload our burdens, our anxieties, and we're able to be at peace with ourselves and with our Savior. Let's just take a minute, Brett, if we could just close this with that.